No, so I was actually uh, prone to opiate addiction prior to the military. <laughs> Thank you for tuning to the show. I really do appreciate it. But I noticed that you haven't subscribed yet. So if you please subscribe to the channel, we can get some amazing guests and help this channel grow. So hit that subscribe button and enjoy. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Type 1 Lifting Podcast. I have the digital content creator and pickleball enthusiast, Evan Slaughter. How's it going, man? Man, it's going good, dude. I appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, no, thank you for coming on. And, and I know you said you just moved to Nashville. So I know you've only been there for a little while. So what is the reason why you moved there was because of Tia or trying to get with Daniel Brandon? <laughs> Funny story. I have seen her at the gym. Like first gym I went to, a buddy of mine owns and she's in there working out. And I was like, no way. This is, it's meant to be, you know? <laughs> so apparently she just moved to Nashville too. So she hadn't been, been here that long as well. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you like it so far? I love it, man. I actually went to college here when okay. I was, you know, in college age. I went to college for a couple of years here before moving back to Birmingham. And my brother went to college here. So he still lives just north of Nashville. Um, still got a, some friends from college in the area. A couple of brands I work with are here. It's only about two and a half hours from Birmingham where I'm from. So not far from the family. Um, so it, it was, it's a good, it's been a good move so far. Yeah. And, and I, it feels like, it's it's a grow it's it's a big city but it's i feel like it's still growing too because i i live about four hours away from because i live in i live in georgia oh, okay. and so um yeah so i last time we were there it was like blown up like all these apartments and it's just like yeah. non-stop so is that is that what you're kind of seeing too totally totally they actually told me i think um when I was looking at apartments right at the end of 2023 it was like december time frame i was looking and one of the places I looked was telling us that I think 14,000 more units were becoming available before the end of 2023. So it's jumping right now, man. Yeah. Do, do you think the people want to go there because they want to wear cowboy boots and all that stuff and be a little country? I don't know. I think it's kind of because country music's definitely, you know, kind of the heart of this place. Mm -hmm. But you're you're seeing more of like an Austin, Texas vibe. If you're familiar yep. with Austin, you know, so there's a good music scene across the board. There's some good pro sports. You know, it's just kind of uh, becoming a, a unique place to be, you know. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Now, um, I don't know if you know this, but we have a little bit of, of something in common. So okay. we're both we're both prior military. Oh, and I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't realize you yeah. were, you were prior military. Yeah, so I'm I was uh, I'm retired Air Force. So okay. I was an Air I was an Air Force medic. Well, not a, like a four and oh five one. It's like almost considered like a medic kind of deal. Yeah. So I I was there for seven years, and I left to go down to Georgia, and I went like inactive reserve. So I was a reservist because I signed up when I was twenty seven, going oh, in. Oh wow! It, yeah, I was super late, super late. Yeah, and so um. And I got out like seven years later and then, you know, moved down here. And then all of a sudden it became a type one diabetic. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did Crazy you get stuff. out like medically retire or just, you just kind of got out? Oh, cool. No, okay. I got, I got out. So I was trying to get medically retired and get like the 50% disability, yeah. but there was like nothing in my files saying I had like any diabetes symptoms or anything like that. Wow. So, so yeah. So, and it's like, it, and they even said, if, if you're a reservist, it's, it's to be honest with you, it's not even, not even worth it because you probably won't yeah. get it. Yeah. Yeah. I've, if, I've heard it's a, it's a pain in the butt. At least it wasn't the army to medically retire. It's a process. Like some people were extending their contracts just to stay in long enough to go through the process of medical. It was ridiculous. Yeah. It's crazy. But, um, out of all the branches, you decided to join the army. So what, what was, what, what was the most interesting thing for you to join the army compared to all the other branches? Man, I, uh, so I basically, you know, I had some friends that were in the military course. I graduated high school in 2004. Mm -hmm. So nine 11 happened my sophomore year. Um, and so getting out of high school, I had some friends that went into the military and it was always, you know, I was always intrigued by, you know, there's a lot going on, heavy action that time. Um, and so whenever I decided to join, I knew nothing about really the branches of service. I knew I wanted to be in some kind of combat MOS. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to deploy. I wanted to do all these cool things. 
And uh, so I went to the Marine Corps first, and it was much harder of a process to join the military than I expected. I thought I was going to walk in and, like, music was going to play, like, oh, you know, like, and they were going to kiss my <laughs> yeah. ass about being here. And thank you, thank you, you know. But that's just not how it goes. It was like, uh, you know, I had to uh, take all these pictures in a PT uniform because at the time they weren't allowing tattoos that were – or they were that's having right, to yeah. get tattoos approved that were showable in a PT uniform. Of course, the guy recruiting me, he's got tattoos up his hands and his neck, you know, so I'm like, whatever, <laughs> yeah, whatever, dude. But, uh, and it was just a long process. I had to get people to write references, do all this stuff. And then I find out that I'm not, I wouldn't even leave to go to boot camp for another nine months. And I kept thinking, well, I don't even know if I want to be in the military in nine months. Like, this is a decision we got to make now. I'm ready to do yep. it now. You know, I thought we'd get yeah. on a bus today and go or something or tomorrow, you know. So anyways, I've kind of shopped around after that. I went to the Air Force next, actually, and kind of looked into the pararescue program, talked to them about what kind of combat MOS options were out there. Um, and then right next door was the Army. So walk into the Army, and um, they were the fastest, easiest to join at the time, fastest to get me to basic training, joined as an infantryman, you know, waited about – three or four months after joining and then got on a bus uh, January and headed out. Mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. Very cool. So, yeah. So um, my, the reason why I joined the air force was because one of the guys I was working with at the hospital or is that was like, Hey, you should join the air force. Did you get better, like better medical experience you can work yeah. with and astronauts and like whatever your heart desires. And I was like, okay, cool. So, and then they told me I had to sign a six year contract and like, and me being 27, like, I don't know anything like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do a month in a month in advance. Like, yeah, you know, shit. Know. so, so it's like six years and I literally had to go to the bathroom and sit down on the toilet and I'm like, is, is this really worth it? Is yeah. this really worth it? So, and I signed up and I, I wish, I wish I could have done the full 20, but you know, I know I just happens. wasn't a desire for me at the time. I don't think, I mean, that's a lot of years. Like you look at guys that come out and unless you do it, like guys that join at 18, do 20 years, they retire, uh, full retirement at 38, you know, and then go get another job on top of having that retirement. Like it just doesn't seem worth it unless you go that route. But that's yeah, a commitment, yeah. dude. That's how you know, you and I both know how hard it is to pull that off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, there's like no, you don't get family time really. You have to go on all these like training sessions and all that stuff. And like, yeah. you know, then getting deployed, that's another thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, you got you got deployed to what was it Afghanistan? Yep. At the time? In Bulldog, Afghanistan. Yep. Yeah. So when they told you that you're getting deployed to Afghanistan, like what was going through your head throughout the whole process of like, hey, I'm getting deployed. Like, you know, what am I going to expect? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I kind of at the time, and I think I, I was probably I always forget the exact years. I know I deployed 2011, 2012. So that would have been, um, let's see, 23 years. Yeah, I would have been, you know, 24, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so still young and not, uh, you know, not, I had that invincible mentality, like, I'm not going to die. No, no, you know, I'm invincible. I, you know, I lived my life that way for so long. Um, but I had just, it was kind of fast. I had just, I, you know, I went to airborne school after infantry training mm -hmm. and then i went to special forces selection in fort bragg and i actually i had to do sopsy which is the prerequisite for an 18 x-ray um to do, which 18 x-ray is basically just like a guaranteed shot to go to selection or at least to sopsy and then selection so mm -hmm. sopsy is like special operations prep and conditioning past that and then you go to selection well i end up failing the last event in selection and getting dropped but because I had done all this stuff and had a decent GT score on the ASVAB and all these, you know, airborne qualified infantry, uh, I got orders to go to this long range surveillance unit in Fort Hood, Texas. And so we get there after I leave Fort Bragg and immediately, of course, find out we're deploying. So it's like, obviously, they were gearing up for deployment, you know, and yeah. trying to get some guys down there. So we came down and immediately sort of started training, then took some leave, uh, for some pre-deployment leave, and then came back and it was time to go. And it just happened so fast, you know, mm -hmm. that was the thing. And plus you're around, uh, you know, a, a group of individuals and a unit that's just, 
people have been deployed before you're, you're, you're training for this. You know, it's like at my level, you know, lower ranking dude at the time, I'm just responding to orders anyways. <laughs> yeah. So wasn't a lot to think about on my end. I think I was just kind of like wanting to deploy, ready to do this. Didn't know what to expect and glad I had good leadership to kind of guide me through it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, when, when you got deployed, I know you got hit by an IED and it kind of jacked your ankle up. So like, obviously like I've, I've never been in that experience pretty much like 99% of the other people have never been in that experience. But what, what, what was, what was that like when you got, when your like Humvee got hit with an IED? Man, it was, uh, you know, at first I didn't know what happened. That was kind of like what I've heard before. I think about it especially being it in the first time. So we actually had just gotten into country um, to, to our FOB where we were going to be at um, for the majority of the deployment. And I'm sitting there on uh, QRF. It was our turn to do QRF, quick reaction for. So anything comes in, we're the first ones to spin up and go. And we get a call. And I mean, this is like a month after being, not even a month after being at the FOB. Mm -hmm. uh, that we have a KIA killed in action. So we're like, you know, as soon as that hit and I heard that, that's when it kind of, everything became real, you know, crap, someone from our unit was just killed. I don't, you know, and we weren't a huge unit, you know, so for the most part, everybody kind of knew each other. Um, so we spin up, you know, we, we start heading out there and actually the guy we were, we were, it happened so fast after getting there that the unit that we were replacing was still there. They were actually, you know, you spend some time doing some overlap so they can take you around and show you all the area and introduce you to the right people and this and that. So they were actually still there. And one of the guys, uh, he was like, I'll drive because I know right where this is at. So he jumps in the driver's seat. I'm in the gunner's spot, stand up turret on a, on a, a Oshkosh Matt V and uh, our platoon sergeants in the you know passenger side. And then I got a buddy who's a dismount sitting kind of by, by my feet. And so we like head out there, you know, it's real rough. Fortunately, we had what's called a mine roller attached to the front. So it's digging through the sand, looking for pressure plate IEDs with the hopes that if it finds one, it sets it off in front of the vehicle. So you don't take the blunt of the blast. Yeah. And our job was to get out there, kind of pull security, help with the, the scene that was going on, you know. And so we're riding through the desert, man, and, and start to cross this wadi, which is a dried up creek bed where it's just real soft and easy to dig, you know. And so... We're going through there and then boom, I just remember hearing this loud, really loud, you know, explosion, but it wasn't like how people think of an explosion, like a big, you know, TV, like, yeah, like Mike, know, Mike, Michael, cloud. yeah, like Michael Bay movies. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This was more like the way I've kind of been describing it is that this is more like if you're right next to a, an 18 wheeler semi truck and all the tires blow out on that truck at once. Oh, you know, it's like a loud pop. And then, of course, it was followed up with like a chemical sensation, like burn, smell, you know, and you just you don't know what's going on. The whole truck's filled with crap. And uh, so, yeah, I, I didn't know it was happening until the the uh, platoon sergeant in the passenger seat up front started calling in contact IED, contact IED. And that's when I was like, oh, shit, we, you know, we hit an IED and uh, I had damaged my ankle. I was standing on some ammo cans because I'm short and I was like getting good visibility above the gun turret. And when that happened and my feet came off those ammo cans, it twisted, you know, rolled my ankle and dislocated a tendon in my ankle. And I had some other bumps and bruises, but ultimately, you know, I was, I was fine, fortunately. So mm -hmm. was anybody else in the, in the Humvee worse off than, than you were at all? Or yeah, the driver, uh, it was his like second time to hit an IED in a month or so. Jeez. And so he was kind of, he was backing out of the kill zone as it happened, you know, put it in reverse and go straight back. And he only got so far before he lost consciousness. And then I remember they had to, you know, the medics came and got him and then I, they medevaced him to uh, Kandahar. And then from there, I hopefully, you know, I never heard, never heard anything else, but I, I'm pretty sure he turned out to be okay. Um, but yeah, they had to fly him to Kandahar. So. Jeez, jeez, that's crazy. So, um, when you when you were getting treated and stuff like that at the hospital, so was it at the FOB at all, or did you go to have to go to Kandahar, or like where did you have to go to get get it treated? 
Yeah, so I, I just went back to the fob and they were able to put like a, a boot, you know, on my leg. And then actually the medic there was, you know, once we kind of diagnosed what was going on with my ankle, um, of course, you take a TBI, you know, test as well. Make sure you pass the TBI test for traumatic brain injury, all that good stuff. Mm. Um, I passed that. Uh, it was just my ankle that was jacked up. And so once they determined it was a dislocated tendon, uh, the medic kind of told me straight up, he was like, look, you could go to Germany and have surgery on this. Like you could fly from here to Germany. We could request that go to Germany, have surgery, but then you would go home. Um, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to stay. I'd always already been planning on doing the 12 month deployment. I was really close with the guys in my group on my team. You know, it was, uh, I'd already planned on, the you know what i was gonna do with the money that i made from being in deployment you know and i was just mm -hmm. thinking i don't want to go you know i want to be here and so but he said and also the surgery on that can kind of go a couple ways it can be sometimes not good not successful he said so if it was me i would let it heal like it is and then if it ever causes problems in the future you know you can get it looked at again but uh so that's what i decided to do and honestly since then it's been fine so it, it's more apt to injury. So if I'm doing something where I'm moving around or, you know, quick movements, I really have to be careful um, because it can sprain or damage easily, but mm -hmm. I haven't had any issues, real issues with it since, since that incident. Wow. Okay, cool, cool. So um, I know you talked in other podcasts that you had like kind of like an opioid addiction, addi addi uh, addiction. So mm -hmm. did that come with the ankle injury or was that like after you left for the military? No. So I was actually, uh, prone to opiate addiction prior to the military. I'd struggled before uh, with, with opiates, um, but nothing's too serious. You know, got off them, was able to join the military, all that good stuff, feeling good. But, you know, it didn't come back around until that injury. And, uh, of course, once I was, you know, being prescribed opiates from the injury and put on pain mm -hmm. management, ultimately, whenever we got back from deployment – that's where it really took off because in my mind, I had a really valid excuse for being on these strong of opiates, even though I knew in my heart that it was not a good thing for me and that I was probably going to go down a road I shouldn't go down. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I'm like, screw this, dude. I've, I've got like free access to this stuff. It's it's a valid reason. Prescription, you know, the government's or the military, you know, through insurance covers the cost of it. And that's kind of what kicked it back off for me for sure. Yeah. So I do. You, so I have like my thoughts on it a little bit, but do you yeah. think that the military actually over prescribes people pain medications or whatnot? Cause I, cause here's the reason why I like, I think that. So when I was, when I was over in, um, was it launch, launch, uh, Kaiser, Kaiser Slotten? Um, yeah. we were at Ramstein air force base where, okay. and so our job was to pick, pick the people up from the airplanes bring them on the bus and then bring them over to the military hospital, which was like maybe like 25 minutes away. And so it was almost like a, a, a we were like kind of like a mass unit. And so there was one dude sitting there, he was going, going to get treated. And he was like, just sitting there on like a normal chair. And he's like, Oh, I, I, I have like a lot of pain right now. And so the, the nurse that was on the, the bus decided to give him morphine. And so, and I was like, holy fuck, are you really giving him morphine right now? And he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, he, that's what we, that's what we give him before they get into the hospital. I was like, you gotta be what? And so I'm like, this guy is just standing here, just sitting here, like completely normal, like doesn't look like he's in pain and you give him, you give him something to, that could be something bad, like later on down the road. So I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you feel that they overprescribe that kind of stuff in the military? I think there there was a pattern of it for sure, and I think it's definitely something that um, is is easily, you know, it's a solution. It's a quick solution. You know, the, as mm -hmm. you and I both know, the military is a lot of box checking, right? You know, do this, you know, check that box, fill this form out. There's a form for everything. There's you know, there's a protocol for everything. And I think for one at one point, the protocol, and this is just my opinion, was to just handle everything medically with prescription stuff. Now, what I've learned through that though, is that especially now I think in the VA and, and with the, or at least in the VA and with the opioid epidemic mm -hmm. that kind of has become prevalent, you know, yeah. um, I think that it's caused them to pull back some. Um, 
the other side of that, like I think it's I think it's harder to just you know go and get on this because my thing was, you know, once I got back to base, it was like all right, the medics, you know, I was having this pain, obvious injury documented from an IED blast. Their their solution was to refer me to pain management, which I had to go to a civilian doctor for, and it was the kind of same thing there. You got a pain management; they know why you're there, mm -hmm. and they're going to put you on something super strong for the most part. So it definitely was an easy way for them to kind of check that box. We did our part, you know, and we handled it this way. Yeah. But I also take some, you know, some of the responsibility for that because I knew I had a problem with opiates and I could have said something <laughs> and, and said, Hey, I don't need to be on any kind of, you know, opioid. Is there another solution? And I started, you know, obviously doing that now being sober from opiates. And I actually had to tell the VA um, after I'd gotten sober that I don't need to be on opioids. So it's in my file that unless something terrible is happening and you, there's no other solution, you know, their first remedy is to not give me opioids. So mm -hmm. yeah, part of that's the, my responsibility. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you think it's kind of like a last, last, like last ditch, ditch effort to give you like opioids if you really, really need it? Is that, or they just want to give you like ibuprofen or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I mean, there was a time where I accidentally shot a pellet uh, like a, a 0.177 caliber, almost close to a 22, you know, air pellet right all the way through my toe. And this was after getting out of the military and everything, wasn't paying attention, thought the safety was on. And I w actually went to put the safety on. It was one of those trigger safeties that's right in front of the oh, yeah. stupidest design in the world. Yeah. And I was on the phone talking to somebody in this conversation. I had the barrel pointed down because there was like a roof over my head and other, other houses around and i was like <laughs> shooting squirrels in the back and i just pulled that trigger man and it shot right through my toe and i went to the emergency room and told him you know i can't be on opiates and he said if we don't prescribe you opiates you're going to be in some serious pain and they did it anyway so you Jeez. know <laughs> yeah that's crazy like when i when i was working in the er in boston is like i would see people coming in all the time for like, you know, they'll, they'll like literally would circle ERs like all around like the neighborhood yeah. and just like say, Hey, I'm, I'm not feeling well. Or like, you know, and like they try to yeah. prescribe like, and, and, and it's mainly in their file too. Like, Hey, this guy goes to like all these different places too. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Like how opioids can like really get somebody to be addicted to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the problem is that uh, once the opioids aren't working enough or you're not getting them like you were through prescription. And then you turn to the streets, you know, and you start buying heroin or fentanyl or whatever. And that's all you get all these overdoses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But um, when did you really notice a pattern that it was like not going the right direction that you wanted to when you were addicted? So like when was like, did you realize it or did someone else realize it and tell you like, Hey, you know, this is not really the right track. We want to see you going. No, yeah, it was a combination of a lot of things. You know, I struggled with sobriety on and off. So, like, I get out of the military. Um, and when I got out of the military, I left, you know, being prescribed to a lot of different things. And then, of course, you lose your TRICARE insurance and all that stuff. You get out. It takes – there's a period. It took me a year to get, you know, everything finalized with the VA before I could start using the VA, which is just absurd. Insane. So, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So, I start seeing, you know, going to a civilian doctor – I've got medical documents from being in an IED incident. They're quick to give stuff out too. And uh, it just kind of continued. And so I struggled, you know, I got in, you know, started kind of, I got into some legal trouble, ended up, I mean, it, it was, you know, it, it went down a dark road for me. And then I found sobriety through, you know, just needing to make some changes and started going to some AA meetings and stuff like that type stuff. My problem was never alcohol or anything. It was just always opiates, you know, but found mm -hmm. a good network of people in there that understood sobriety and understood addiction and understood and kind of could help me through that process. So ultimately having some good friends and, and a solid network, you know, yeah, they recognize when something's off, but when things get bad enough to where it's like, all right, I got to do something to change this or I'm going to end up in jail or dead or what, you know, and I don't want that for myself, you know, that's for me, you know, they call it, some call it hit, you know, finding your rock bottom or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, in my experience, I've, I've found a bottom and then knocked the floor out of it and found a new bottom and then <laughs> knocked the, you know, so I don't even really like finding that bottom because what's the ultimate bottom, you know, death or life imprisonment, you know, 
it can yeah. lead to that. So for me, it was just things got bad enough to where I wanted to make a change. And I was, I'm grateful that I had the desire to want to make a change and to want to live and to want, you know, to, to not want to live that way and to do so. Cause not everybody feels that way, you True. know? Yeah. Yeah. They just think they're a, like, they're perfectly okay. And then they have like a, a group of people talking to them, you know, and be, they're like, no, I'm perfectly fine. And so then they, you know, keep on still using cause they think their, their life is perfectly okay. Yeah. That, or they're so miserable that they don't care. And That's true. their yeah. only solution is to end their life or to, you know, do something drastic. And, and so I was very fortunate. I consider it being very fortunate that, I didn't have that desire to to want to take those kind of drastic measures, and I would I wanted to do something about it. Yeah, and so um, I heard of another podcast. You were in a rehab facility too. Yeah, and so that was a huge help for you too. And also, that's where you found pickleball. Yeah. So so I know I know pickleball is like considered the new CrossFit that like everyone wants to tell everybody that like, hey, I do pickleball. So yeah. do you do you kind of see that for the doing pickleball? Yeah, yeah, man. It's becoming uh it was so funny because when I did discover it at the rehab that I was at, it was like a kind of one of those things, you know, fate or whatever, where you can't, you know, and I just fell in love with the game and it got me back active again. And it was so much fun playing it with your friends and socializing and having a good time that when I got out of the rehab, I continued to do it. And I didn't know how big it was or how big it was becoming. Um and then I, I discover this whole world of pickleball and professional pickleball, and it just seems to continue to be blowing up and and going. But yeah, there's definitely a correlation, you know, with buying paddles and buying gear and playing all the time and, play, you know, using all this terminology and having your little group of friends, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's crazy because um, I have a, an Amazon, um, I have an Alexa, like an Amazon yeah. home, like Alexa thing. And like, once in a while I'll see like a, an image saying watch live pickleball on through like a lot. And I'm like, what? There's like live pickleball, like everywhere. Like you can find yeah. it anywhere. And I'm like, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and I think the reason it's doing that is because Amazon prime has shown some of the championship rounds. So they were streaming the pro stuff on YouTube. So YouTube stream, they'd show the live events and then like for the championship matches, I think Amazon Prime picked it up okay. for, for some of them. And then now they've got like a partnership, I think, coming out with the tennis channel. That's like the pickleball channel. And, you know, so it's it's making its way around. <laughs> yeah. And, and you have your own paddle, too. Got my own paddle out. Yeah. So I, one of the first deals I signed, you know, I started making this pickleball content, doing my comedy stuff and was at the time, again, kind of oblivious to how big it was. So when I started making some of these comedy videos around pickleball that started to have success, I was getting contacted a lot. People wanting to send paddles out and stuff. And we would love for you to use our paddle or try, you know. So one of the companies that approached me was Valer Pickleball out of Austin, Texas. And I love their stuff. I love their paddle. I love their design. It's quality paddle. They got a real, it's cool. It's, you know, they got stuff for the, that's professional quality. So you could definitely play in a professional tournament with it. And, and people do. But they got stuff for, you know, they understand the importance of the rec players out there and the majority of the people just going out and playing and having fun. So we we signed a deal, you know, I've got like a, a multi-year deal with them. And then Sweet. just this past year, they were like, we got to put out a, a custom fit to serve paddle. So we did. And we worked on the design for a while. It took several months and we finally got it there and got it out, man. It's It seems to be doing well so far. That's awesome. That's so cool. I, and I've seen the paddle. It looks, it, it, it has like, you know, you with the glasses, like yeah. with just like just the glass. And it's, I, it's a great design. I, lo I love it. So I appreciate it. I was really happy with how it came out. Yeah. I mean, I would be too, if I saw that. So definitely, but um, you talked about doing content creation. So did you, after you came, came out of rehab, is that when it started or like when TikTok came pretty popular? Like when, when did you realize like, Hey, I want to possibly get into this kind of space? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, I got out uh, of the rehab thing and just didn't know what I was going to do, you know, at the time. I was uh, fortunate that I had, you know, my parents that were supportive and, and allowed me to just go back to their place for a little bit, catch my breath, figure out what, what I wanted to do next. And I owned a house at the time, and this was, you know, 2022. So not, mm -hmm. you know, real estate's doing really good at the time. Um, and I decided to put the house on the market and sell it and it did well. And it, it allowed me to kind of pay off any debts I had. And then also had some money where it was like, all right, there's no pressure here. 
for me to just rush into another job. You know, I was unhappy with some of the office jobs I had done. I mean, I enjoyed it at first, but got burnt out real fast. Just kind of wanted something a little bit more exciting, something more I was passionate about. So during that time that I've got a little bit of comfort room there with the, the money from the selling of the house, I decided to kind of start just having fun making some comedy stuff. I was always into comedy, always considered the funny guy, always liked making people laugh from a young age, you know, till now. And so I got on TikTok. I had an account on TikTok before that, but wasn't super active with making stuff on it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to kind of figure this out and start playing around with it. So I did and started to have some success. You know, I had some some people like a lot of the stuff I started kind of, I think the first thing that hit was like the single mom stuff that I do, like uh, trying to get the single mom next door to notice me and like yep, yep. all these just comedic <laughs> thirst trap style stuff, you know? So once that kind of had success, I was like, all right, people, people, you know, like, like what I'm putting out. Let me go a little further, see if I can do some sketch type comedy and see if they like that. And they did. And so I was kind of just doing it around stuff that I was involved in at the time. So pickleball was a big one getting back in shape, you know, that's where the CrossFit and the fitness stuff came from, trying to get back in shape after being out of shape, you know, I was just kind of choosing things I was doing and sort of poking fun at myself and then found that people could relate to it because they were in the same boat or knew someone in the same boat or whatever. So just sort of took off from there. Yeah. And so do you, when you were doing it, started the content creating, uh, so did you decide, were you like filming like every single day or did you have like a set thing? Do you like, did you brainstorm most of the time before doing those skits or like, was it kind of like, Oh, like last minute, like, Oh, okay. This would be a great idea. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. So on TikTok at the time, what I was reading and hearing um, was that you should post about four times a day to make, mm. to try to get something to jump off. And now that could be a quick 15 second trend type video that you just do your own take on a trend, or it could be this, or it could be that. So, for a little while, I was trying to hammer that and just put them out there until the single mom stuff took. And I'd kind of, with the single mom stuff, I just sort of, it was my own thing. I, I took a twist off something, you know, it wasn't even, you, you see maybe some similar type stuff, but not really, you know, I just kind of decided to do it one day and thought it was funny. And sure enough, it, it worked. But uh, then I kind of, as I started getting, longer form sketch stuff and all that i found i was like all right i'm not doing more than one a day i don't want you know i'm gonna do just one longer form sketch here and see if that works and then once they started to do well and kind of take off it was like i would literally just sort of think that day of what you know it was like a in the moment thing like all right what do i want to do today you know i want to do something on fitness or i want to do this and then go out there and start kind of shooting it and as i was shooting it it would just sort of turn into what it was turning into yeah. I've, I've heard so many people that are like, Oh, you, I, you need to post like three times a day. And I'm like, who has the, like, who has the yeah. time to do three videos a day? I mean, like I was working at the time, like, and it's maybe one, if that, like, and yeah. it's like, not everyone wants to see me lifting weights or like doing my podcast or anything like that. So it's just like, uh, you know, that is hard. hard. Yeah. Especially and with it, a job. I was fortunate to not have a job. So I had the time to kind of do it, but even still, man, it just, more than once is a lot to ask of anybody. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But, um, while, while you're on TikTok and slowly growing that, um, that space. So did you have any people that you were like looking on TikTok or even YouTube or any other platform that kind of was a big inspiration for you to kind of get into that space? Yeah. You know, there was, um, I kind of discovered more, more content creators that I liked as I started doing it, um, you know, with TikTok, it's, it's easier, I guess, because you can just scroll. All you're doing is scrolling constantly. It's yeah. not like Instagram as much. Uh, it's just constant scrolling. And so you're just coming across these videos, right? And you're seeing all these different videos of people. And I, what I would do is notice which ones were being very successful, um, how they were shot and just kind of learning that way, you know, like, looking at the quality of the video that they're putting out, looking at the audio, maybe, you know, why did this video do, do so well versus this one and, and learning through that process and then taking it and kind of making, forming it for what I wanted to do. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that was the best way, especially being new to kind of learn how to do it. 
Yeah. Have Have you repurposed your your content to go into YouTube at all for the YouTube Shorts? Yeah. So I'll I'll repost a lot of times for the Shorts. I, you know, I, I want to kind of part of my goal for 2024 at least has been trying to get more serious about YouTube. And I just, I want to figure out kind of what to do. Cause as you know, I mean, YouTube is, it's a whole different beast, right? I mean, the shorts are good, but people aren't going to YouTube for, for the shorts. They're going really because you can watch all kinds of stuff on YouTube movies, you know? Yep. Yep. So I, I want to do a better job of that. I started throwing stuff on, on, uh, on YouTube that I make on Instagram and TikTok just to try to get some subscribers going on YouTube and get a little bit of traffic going on YouTube. So I'm going to keep doing that until I figure out, I think what I want to do with, uh, with my YouTube channel for sure. Yeah. So I, I try to post one short every single day for at least six to seven days. And so I've noticed, um, I've, I've have two, two videos that have gone over a million. Dang. That's awesome. And, and it's crazy because like one of them, I'm not even in it. And it's just like some dude from TikTok that I follow. He did a, he did like a heavy clean and he rolled backwards and he was on one of those rate, like, um, like those elevated platforms with like the gap in between and the bar went over then fell in the gap. And so he got Ooh. his neck, neck stuck on there. And so that was one of them that actually just went to the moon. And then there was another one where I, I, I think I was, I was on my dock and this kid tried to do a clean and jerk and he like, he jerked it, but he was like off balance. Mm -hmm. And so I said, what would you do in this situation? And then like he, he dropped the bar and literally almost hit his head, but I'm like, Ooh, and it just shot skyrocketed to like 1.2 million like views. Dang. And I'm like, how is, and then like I do some other ones and I'm barely getting like 4,000, a thousand. So my, my goal for me is like just to get over a thousand views. Yeah. You know, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll be happy. So, but it's like, or even a couple subscribers. The main thing is just like the views and subscribers. Yeah, yeah. YouTube is such a different beast. I mean, all the platforms are that way, man. Like I always tell people all the time that are really successful on Instagram and they're not successful on TikTok or they're, because my, my TikTok has slowed down a little bit because I've been so focused on Instagram. But, yeah. but I, when I was doing TikTok and having success on TikTok, I wasn't focused on Instagram. And then yeah. Instagram started doing well. So I became focused on Instagram. So it's like, you really have to watch these platforms. Like for those listening that are interested in this, in my experience, it's like watch each platform separately. You know, like if I want to find success on YouTube, I'm going to find a page that is kind of got the vibe that I like and similar to what, how I would plan to shoot and edit my stuff and put, you know, and then not copy by any means, but just, use that you know look at that as as kind of an outline and then take yeah. it and, and replicate it into my own you know original type content and just let it fit and find stuff from other channels and pull it together and make it into something that works so it takes yeah. a lot of watching content too i think to be good at it yeah how, how much content do you watch per day roughly man not much anymore but when i started <laughs> i was always constantly scrolling but now it's like because i have something that's you know i've got an audience watching uh, the stuff that I'm putting out and, and, and liking kind of how, how I'm putting out these videos, I don't necessarily have to watch as much. I just don't have the time, but every now and then, you know, I'll just look to have fun and watch and everything. And I'll see something and go, huh, I need to do something like that in the CrossFit space or something like that in the pickleball space or something, you know? So it's always good to consume a little bit, I think. Yeah, you should. You should. Well, I'm not telling you what to do, but maybe you should consider doing like a picky pickleball like meme video of you trying to move all your stuff like out of the apartment and take the pickleball like you know thing and hit the boxes out of the door or something like that. Just something, <laughs> yeah. something stupid. Or you could do yeah. like, or you can like clean boxes or something like that. Just like pick them up and clean them and like just throw them out the hallway for like that's a crossfit right. thing. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but uh, while do, while doing being a content creator, so you know, you, you probably get like hundreds or even thousands of people of like writing comments of like laughing emojis or like, you know, someone that's like, Hey, you know, thank, thank you for doing this. Just like kind of turn my day around. But all those, all those great comments, do you get like bummed out when you see like one negative one? And if you do, how do you kind of like take that away um, from your thoughts? Man, excellent question. So you know, that, that was, that's, that's the struggle, right? It's like, especially with people, I think that are younger, um, trying to do content, that's where it gets hard. Cause I know it, 
when I was younger, a comment like that affected me a lot more. And I think a lot, but yeah, definitely sometimes get people trolling or just saying stupid stuff. And, and the way I've learned to handle that, and it's actually been a blessing for me because it's helping me to grow. Um, and it's helping me to become, become a more confident person and become someone. So like one of the, one of the reasons I think, especially getting out of that rehab and everything, uh, I just decided that I was going to stop caring what other people thought about me and, and learn to be happy and learn to live life and say, yeah. forget, screw all these other people and what all they think. And I took that mindset into my, my content, but I also have been very deliberate and specific about responding to anyone who says something negative with kindness, right? It, it wins every time in my book, you know, you're going to have someone say something stupid or whatever, or say, you know, you get a lot of people, especially as I'm trying to lose weight, making fat jokes or fat comments. And they know nothing about my history. They know nothing about my military history. They know nothing about being injured in combat and receiving a purple heart and nothing about, you know, they don't know. And, and part of me, you know, in my mind at first is like, this motherfucker, like I'm gonna show him, dude. I'm gonna, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but I was like, that does no good, you know. So what I've decided to do is, is you know, if someone responds, is comments or something. You know, you're right, man. I've definitely got some weight to lose working on it. You know, appreciate you watching the video and thanks for your comment. You know, and I've had several people, and a lot of times I'll pin, I'll pin a negative comment to the top and respond with kindness and let other people see it and and you know, see how I'm choosing to respond to that because I've not to be like, look at me and look how good, but to just maybe set a new standard, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. maybe we can do things differently because obviously the person for the most part, that's making those comments or saying these negative things, they've got something going on in there. You know, they're not happy with themselves. So they put other people down. They're not all the typical stuff. And I know this because I used to be that person. Now that's not the case with everybody. Some people are just being assholes and trolls and want to have fun with it. But yep. a lot of times, whenever I've chosen to respond kindly to these people and everything, I've even had some people come back and message and apologize and say, hey, I shouldn't have said that. You know, I was do to do you know, and it was like, OK, so there's, you know, choose yeah. to respond with kindness. And, and and the reason I do that for real is the main one of the main reasons is because it helps me grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Like instead yeah. of getting angry, holding a resentment, blowing up, it's just always always say it's. You know, I used to think that if I didn't defend myself or stand up, not defend myself, it's the wrong words, because there's definitely a time and place to defend yourself. But if I didn't respond with anger or get back in someone's face or do this or say this negative thing to them, then then I was weak. Right. Like I wasn't being a man or whatever. But I found that that's not the case. What what strength looks like is like choosing not to respond that way and choosing to to respond with some kindness and some grace and some mercy and show those people some love even though it's super hard for, to do that. So like yeah. I'm growing through that process. So oftentimes I look forward to a negative comment because it's like, yes, chance to grow here. Got a chance to grow here. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I've, I've gotten a couple and I've deleted them. And then like for me, like with your way of doing it, I'm like, damn, like when you were talking, saying that, I was like, damn, I, sh I really should have done that. I really should have done yeah. that. So. Now I'll delete some every now and then if I'm just not in the mood or it's yeah, yeah. super early and I'm like this dumbass, you know, and I'll just delete it. <laughs> but so that's always an option. I think deleting is definitely better than you see people like, yeah, well, I just looked at your profile and you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. It makes you look dumb when you do that. So, yep, yeah. Yeah. Totally right. Totally right. But, uh, you, you were talking about your fitness jersey and uh, fitness journey and like losing weight. So I know you're doing CrossFit and CrossFit content. So how did, how did CrossFit come about for you? And you know, what made you kind of stick with it? Um, well, I'd always kind of known about CrossFit even whenever I wasn't doing it. Um, and then whenever I decided to get back in shape or start working towards getting back in shape, um, my brother was telling me that he had just gotten into CrossFit and he was telling me, you know, about him and his friends doing it. You got to try it, man. It's really good. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I'd always known. I was like, dude, I mean, I know it can get your ass in shape. You know, I've seen it. I've seen it for people. Like I know, I know yeah. you stick to it and you stay committed to it. Like it'll get you in shape. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, I, I think I will try to give this a shot. And so I started making some content around it. And then that led to me getting more involved into it, being invited to gyms, being, inv you know, 
And uh, what I found whenever I started going to those, because a, a lot about what I talk about on my platform too, is how challenging it can be to be the person that's not in good shape and then and walk into an environment where you're just yes. uncomfortable. There's a lot of in shape people. Um, even if you're not just talking about CrossFit gym specifically, but any gym, oh, yeah, definitely. you know, yeah. there's a confidence issue there. That's what a lot of people have said. Like my content helps them to get back into the gym and to get back, you know, they see me doing it and not caring about what people think and how I look and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, maybe it'll, it'll help somebody get back into the environment. But what I found with the CrossFit environment is, and, and I'm sure you know, this is they're super loving, welcoming people, oh, yeah, and accepting absolutely. people and motivating. And then you get there and you realize like, Hey, I'm not the only one that's out of shape here. You know, I'm not the only one who's struggling with confidence issues about coming out here. I'm not. And then you form a little, a little friend group and then you kind of get more and more and more into it. And they're even the most fittest of, of people, even the most elite athletes out there in my experience have been so gracious and kind and helpful and uh, with, with me and my journey and supporting that. And I know it's like that for others. So I yeah. just kind of fell in love with the, with the CrossFit environment and community. Yeah. So when I was, when I was personal training, we had um, always, we always had people that were like overweight coming in and being like, you know, I'm really nervous, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, Hey, like, don't worry about it. All these people in here are trying to do something and they're not really con they're, they're not concentrating on you. So mm -hmm. just focus on you. You know, you're definitely, you know, if you stick with me, you're definitely get, going to get people saying like, Hey, you're doing great. I see you working really hard. And that's, that's what they got. Like I would literally have people that come from the gym that are on the working out at the same time walk up to my clients and saying, Hey, I see that you're doing, you're doing a great job. You're looking great. Keep it up. And so, yeah, and it's great. It's like, everyone's so worried about other people. They just, just focus on what they need to do at hand and not worry about anybody else because they don't, because uh, yeah. they don't care. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard to get to that place. I, I get that a lot with the whole people see me and they're like, man, if I just had one, I'll see that comment a lot. If I just had a little bit of this man's confidence or a little bit, you know, it's like, man, I'm not doing anything different than you're doing. It's just what I'm doing is deciding not to care <laughs> what other people think about me and, yeah. and letting that affect how I choose to live my life. Because for a long time it did. And I think it does for a lot of people. You know, we all can, can still get, and I still have to catch myself too, but it's easy to, to let others dictate how you feel and how you feel about yourself and how mm -hmm. you love yourself and how you do that because you have one negative experience or someone laughs at you or this or that, you know, then, then you're like, man, you know, I, I need to make some changes or I'm never going back to that gym again, or I'm never forget working out. That's not for me. Or I'm, and you don't have realized how, how big of an impact that can be on somebody's life. Yeah. You know what I course. mean? So yeah, I try to set a different example and, and show some love. It's like, can you mention like people coming up to some clients of yours that were out of shape or whatever, and they start seeing some changes and someone, someone makes a compliment like, man, you're, you're losing weight. Like that's so huge for somebody because that person working out, they probably don't see the change, you know, because mm -hmm. someone else usually sees it and notices it before you will. Yeah. Um, Cause we're always looking at ourselves. We're our biggest critic. We're always, you know, looking in the mirror, this and that. It's like, we have to live with ourselves every day. So we don't see the changes like other people do. So, you know, that's kind of a reminder for me too. like, be the person that's making those compliments. You know, if you mm -hmm. see someone that, you know, would benefit from that, say it, you know, don't hold it back. So. Yeah. Especially for guys too, because yeah. guys don't really get compliments compared to like females or whatnot. So like even saying like, Hey man, that was great form or like that was, that looked like a great lift. You know, that, that one little positive feedback that like, like quote that you get, like, you know, word that you gave them is would probably make their day, make shit, make their whole week. Who knows? Because yeah. they don't get like, I've noticed guys don't really get compliments. Yeah. That yeah. Much as compared to females. So like just that one little thing can be, do a lot for, for somebody. Yeah, totally. So, um, so when you got into CrossFit and you started doing CrossFit content, um, you started, you know, you started getting more and more, you know, sponsors or whatnot, are people like promoting your product. So what are, what are some of the ones that you have been involved with and what makes you want to, like, you probably get tons of emails or direct messages for sponsors saying, Hey, try my stuff. What are the ones that, that you like that make you want to stick with them? Yeah. So, you know, 
when when brand deals started happening and this this started growing, um, what I tried to do was find a way because I didn't want to take from I didn't want my audience to only see a bunch of ads, you know. Yeah, one that's the best way to kill a growing content is just shove ads in their face. Yeah, you know, I wanted to provide something, and I always was, was providing this comedy stuff. So when it came, but to do this full time, you got to make money at it. And the best way to make money at it, and in, in my opinion, at, at, at the influencer level, is you got to market some stuff, right? You got to have some sponsorships. So I, I found a way to incorporate products into my comedy routine. So for me, what that looks like is if a brand approaches and it's just not a good fit, it's not going to be something that a product that I'm going to use or a product that I would, it, that would make sense to go in one of my comedy routines, or I just couldn't think of a way to make it funny or whatever, then mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it because it just, it, it, it wouldn't feel right. You know, I want, I still want to, my focus is to still put out funny, good, watchable videos that if you care about the product or not, doesn't matter. You're, you're going to get some laughs out of it anyways. But I found that partnering with the right brands, you know, RX Smart Gear, Ice Barrel, Blokes is another good one. I work, you know, I work with several. Um, and they all fit into what I'm kind of doing, you know, the pickleball stuff or the fitness stuff. And they also are very, you know, the, the, the ones that I'm working with, they're never, it was never dependent upon my results, right? Because I do a lot mm -hmm. of fitness stuff and a lot of pickleball stuff. Um, it was never like, hey, you know, love you using our product, but really wish you would kind of lose some weight now because it's making us look but You know, it's yeah. not about that. You know, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a part of the journey. You know, they're just supporting and they're, you know, and and it was, it's a break from the normal fitness content you see. It's not some rip dude using this product and showing you how to do this perfect lift and people are just watching it going, yeah, right, buddy. I'll never have abs like that or I'll never, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's so just finding the right ones that fit and then allow me to kind of do my thing with it. I love it when the conversation, it's like, Hey, we love your content. We don't want to tell you what to do at all. If you could just focus on this product or focus on this aspect of the benefits of the product and then incorporate it into your stuff. That's all we, you know? So I love that. You know, I don't want to get on there and have someone dictate what I'm doing because then I just feel like I wouldn't make something genuine. Mm -hmm. True. True. So, um, you've been, you've been bouncing around like all over the place and stuff like that. So how do you, you know, maintain your fitness and eating healthy and while like traveling to all these different places and obviously the different time zones and stuff and that kind of jack you up. So how do you manage that whole situation? That's so tough sometimes, man. That, that was one of the things I struggled with for sure. In the first part of this journey, Tra you know, it's traveled a lot in 2023 and I was still trying to get in shape. Now, what was nice is that a lot of the traveling I was doing was was around fitness stuff or CrossFit stuff. So you're going to mm -hmm. be kind of in some environments where they're like, hey, let's go hit this workout or hey, let's go do this, you know. But I started having real results for me. And this is just me. But when I started working with blokes, um, which if you don't know, there's blokes, which is men's comprehensive health, joy, women's wellness, which is the female side of it. It's basically like you get your blood tested. You know, you have a Zoom call with a doctor. They go go over your blood and you figure out what's going on. You see what's going on. You know, I had super low testosterone, like insanely low testosterone. Uh, I was borderline type 2 diabetic. I was, you know, all these issues from eating bad and being overweight. And, do, and so I was scared to do it at first. I was scared to do the blood test. And yeah, then yeah. I was like, but... You know, I know it's going to be bad. Give it to me, doc, you know, <laughs> and he, he, get, he get, you know, we were, at, but I felt so much relief after seeing and hearing the things. And it's like, Hey, look, all these things are fixable, man. We, we got to fix it. Let's fix it though. So they put me on some things to get my testosterone levels up and, and raising so that we can, you know, operate like I should be operating. Um, I got on semaglutide, which is basically like Ozempic, uh, which a lot of people are having success with. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm down, you know, like 35 pounds since I yeah, from man. that. So nice. Good for you. I had to have a jump start. You know, I had to have something help me. I had to get optimized, you know, internally so that I could start seeing. And that's only sparked me living a healthier life, like starting to actually lose weight, um, and getting my energy and my strength back up and all that stuff from the testosterone, getting back to normal has only helped me to live 
a healthier life and make better decisions. Now that yeah. I'm now that I'm losing weight again and starting to look better and feel better and all these things, um, I'm starting to be more aware of what I'm putting into my body. I'm starting to be more aware that I need to prioritize working out each day. I'm starting to be, you know, it's just making me want to live a healthier lifestyle. And uh, so I had I had to I, I was glad that I was able to work with blokes and that they they came alongside me and said, let's get your blood work done. Let's see what's going on. And now we do it. I think every three months you, you get your blood work done, get on a call again. They check mm -hmm. your levels. They see the progress. They see if they need to change anything. So it's been super, super helpful. Yeah. So I, I know you said you were wanting to get on a healthier path. But Mike, one, one of the questions I had was, do you think if you lose like you get to the weight that you really want to get to, do you think that will hurt your brand because it was mainly like based on you being overweight or whatnot? So like, and how, how are you think you would, would you being fitter will change that? I love that question. I get that question a lot. Um, I get a lot of times people saying like, if this dude gets in too good a shape, he's not going to be funny anymore. If this dude, you know, and so I, it doesn't bother me because I've been in shape a lot more than I've been out of shape in my life. And a lot of people don't know that, you know, a lot yeah. of people don't know that I was in the military, in the infantry, went through special forces selection, best shape of my life. And I was always funny. I was always the funny guy. I think it'll change what the content looks like a little bit um, and how I approach the content because a lot of the stuff I do now, yeah, I take my shirt off and it's funny. I take, you know, I, I choose to do things a little bit differently to kind of emphasize, you know, but I think it's just going to, it's, it'll be a good change for my content. It'll give me something new to do. But at the same time, a part of it's been like outside of the comedy um, fit to serve, you know, my page has a, I have a message behind it, you know, finding your purpose, living out your purpose, whatever that looks like, doesn't matter how you look physically, whatever it's, we're all built in some way to serve. What does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. um, kind of the overall quick summary of the message, but you know, I want to be able to take, what I've done and, and say, Hey, look, this is how I chose to get back in shape. You know, a lot of times how, how I look physically was dependent again, like we talked about on, cause I wanted to look good and, and, you know, impress other people and have friends and have a girlfriend and have all these things. Yep. It was like, it was very superficial of a reason. And it wasn't a lasting reason for me to stay in shape. Cause obviously I got out of shape. For me, it's it's a different message now. It's like I care about my physical health because I first did something about my mental health, which has caused me to have a new lease on life, a new look at life. Like I care about my physical health now because I want to experience life. I want to be able to do more things. I want to be able to go places. I want to have longevity in life. Yeah, And that came from fixing my mental health first. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's yeah. a big part of the message. And I think ultimately it's like, I'm doing all this fitness stuff and, and pickleball stuff. And if I don't lose weight, people are going to think I'm full of shit. Most, you know, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, got to yeah, start yeah. losing some weight at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think it's going to be a good inspiration for people. Like, Hey, look at where I was now. Look where I was before into where I'm at now. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree. Much, I, yeah. yeah. So, um, you've been, uh, so with these sponsors, you've been to like a bunch of places, especially in the CrossFit and the pickleball uh, space. So out of all the places you've been to, what has been the best place that you've gone to for sponsors and why? Ooh, that is a tough one. All right. Number one, I've got the number one already, but okay. there's been a lot of good one. CrossFit games have been fun. Uh, multiple pickleball tournaments, professional pickleball tournaments have been fun to go to. Um, anywhere where you go and you get to see people that really enjoy and appreciate and engage with the content and they come up and talk to you and everything has, has been a blast. It's so humbling and it, it motivates me to keep going, man, and keep, yeah. keep doing this thing and keep pushing. Um, but with Chubby's, which is a clothing sponsor of mine, love Chubby's clothes, wear them all the time, um, got done several deals with them and then now currently on a one year deal. Um, they invited me last year to tight end university, which is George Kittle, Travis Kelsey and Greg yep. Olson's event for the tight ends. And it's actually here in Nashville. And it was so cool. I mean, I was the only influencer that Chubby's invited out, which was fun. And they had some, you know, because they have a clothing deal with George Kittle and George Kittle has his own Chubby's kind of clothing line deal. Um, 
they were a big sponsor of that event. So they had me come out to help make some content with them. And we got to experience the whole thing, be on the <laughs> field, you know, with them while they're training, go to the parties at night, shoot some stuff with George Kittle, shoot some stuff, you know, meet Rob Gronkowski, meet Travis Kelsey, meet, you know, doing all these things. Theo Vaughn's there, you know, just Josh Allen came down to throw some passes to the guys. It was just really cool. That's um, awesome. Busting with the boys guys were there who were based out of Nashville as well. It was uh, a lot of fun and kind of a who's who of, you know, in that in that realm, especially for NFL tight ends and and people that make content around it and just friends of George Kittle and them. You know, it was so cool, man. Yeah, that's awesome. How, how was Waterpalooza for you? Because well, actually, first of all, before that, I literally get Chubby's advertisements with you on it almost like <laughs> literally on an hour basis. It's like literally I'm, I'm scrolling through Instagram and it's just like, oh, there's Evan again. There's Evan again. And it's like either you by yourself or with like, I, I don't know, um, was the Buttery Bros one, like one of the ads too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so probably, like, li- yeah. Literally either one of those two are like, there maybe another one. Like literally I see your face like every single time if I see an ad for Chubby's. It's so good, man. Yeah, I love Chubby's, man. That's a lot. Of, it's a lot of fun doing work with them they're they're cool to work with yeah so how was waterpalooza was that your first time going this year yeah yeah had a blast man it was uh it was so much fun just being in miami the crowd was hyped you know um tons of of fans of the content there i got to meet and hang out with and just see you know some athlete friends that are my of mine uh do some more stuff with the buttery bros so it was it's it's a party man it's a party Yeah. yeah The, the funniest one, I think the funniest um, meme that you did was, I think it was RX Mark Gear when you had those trainer like jump rope yeah, yeah. and like, you're shaking it. And there's like a, I don't know who that guy was, but the guy would like, would like full tatted out and just like, a, like, you know, just swim trunks. Yeah. That's it. Not even swim trunks, like, you know, a banana hammock. Yeah. And, like that's... you guys are doing stuff and like doing dances. And the guy, and the guy from RX Mark is like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh my buddy, Lucas Doni. He's, he's in, uh, he he's in San Diego where Arx Marker is and friends with Arx Marker. And a lot of times when they go go do shows, he'll come and and help out, you know. Um, and he always he brought his speedo with him and he was like, because we <laughs> wanted to go, you know, down to ice barrel booth and get in one of the ice barrels, and he was gonna wear his speedo. And then when he put it on, it's like we gotta do my friend Crystal, who's like the brand director at RX, she was like, We gotta do something, the speedo with the thing, and <laughs> and then Dave, you know, of course Dave Newman's there, and we had the the things were shaking her the trainers so like the tempo trainers mm-hmm. it's like he uses those just those handles it's basically like a maraca maraca is what i was trying to use them as where you shake it and make the noise yep. he's you know it's like to get your tempo down for double unders or whatever right they make noise every time you do it and so i was like this would be funny to use these like maracas and <laughs> that was so good that's awesome. That's awesome. So um, we're getting close to the end. So um, I have some like rapid fire questions. They're not, okay. they're not, re- I always say they're not really rapid fire. So you can kind of take as long as you want on these. So, okay. <laughs> um, so obviously it's February. Um, do you have any goals that you want to hit like personally or business wise at the end of the year? Yeah. End of the year goals. Um, so I'd always kind of set follower count goals. Like TikTok, I think I wanted it's either 200 or 250,000 followers on TikTok. I think 200 to 250 on Instagram as well. I think I set 5,000 subscribers, maybe five or 6,000 subscribers as a goal for for YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, but another business goal of mine was kind of like we discussed with with growing the YouTube side of things and trying yep. to figure out kind of what that looks like and and dedicating some more time to that. Yeah, I to be honest with you, I really think if you start putting your content out there, like you're gonna get that five thousand like real quick, yeah, real real quick. Because for me, like obviously I do the podcast on there, and I do like lifting what like me lifting weights and stuff on there. Yeah, and so like I get some growth in that, but I th- I think they're le- more leaning towards like the meme side because so there's sometimes when I log on to YouTube on my phone, it goes straight to the shorts because yeah. they're they're trying to promote it. So I yeah. I I think. I think you could easily get five five k, easily on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I need to focus on on putting some stuff out there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, do you have a favorite book you like to read or like give as a gift to your friends? 
Gosh, I'm not a huge reader. And I got asked that question on another podcast not long ago. And I felt like a dumbass because I was like, I can't even think of one book. <laughs> the Bible? <laughs> Is that a safe answer? That's a um, safe answer. Yes, that's good. <laughs> that's a safe answer. We'll go with the Bible. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, what What is something that you like to do that no one has no idea that you like to do it? Play the guitar. Um, not, I'm okay at it. You know, I'm okay at it. I, I, I'm, that was actually another kind of goal for mine this year is to play it every day, at least for a few minutes and, and get better at it. But I enjoy playing the guitar. Mm, very cool. So do you have like a, a six string? Cause my, my dad used to play guitar and he had a 12 string. I've got a six string acoustic. Yeah. Couldn't okay. imagine playing okay. a 12 string. <laughs> yeah. He was like, it was, he was like a wizard on that thing. He would just sit there and just like jam. Like he, he used to do like, um, sing like, you know, church, church music and stuff like that. And, and like he would play his guitar yeah. there. And like, man, it he was like a wizard on that thing. Just That's like, crazy. it was, it was unreal. And I'm like, I want to learn how to play this guitar. And he's like, it's going to take you a very, very long time. So <laughs> and I'm like, thanks. Oh, okay. Dad. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. So, um, but uh next question so what is in your gym bag Ooh, create try create creatine gummies take them okay. with me everywhere i don't know if you've tried them yet and this is not, not i'm not sponsored by them so this is not a plug <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they're fantastic uh and i like getting in creatine i've, I've been doing a lot more of that um uh, i just got today in the mail so this is going in there some the danny spiegel edition tear shoes okay i don't know if you've seen them i have i have she sent some to me and it was like a surprise kind of because i was like tear sent something and i look and it's danny spiegel's new shoe so cool looks really cool the packaging is cool you open the box you know there's a little postcard in there from her talking about you know and uh the shoes look really good so those are going in the bag immediately okay um I'm not a huge pre-workout guy, but actually I started taking, I took it tonight before I went to work out, but Organifi has got um, greens and red juices and stuff. And you use the reds before a workout, man, it, mm -hmm. it does kind of get the blood pumping and flowing a little bit. So I like to do that instead of like a jittery, um, you know, thing. Then of course I got to have my RX, RX smart gear jump rope. A yeah. couple of them, you know, to be ready. They, they, they made so you know, you can get them custom done to your size, right? So you got your jump rope, so you're ready to go. And then they got some grips too that I like. So, yeah. and a towel, you know, little, little deodorant, freshen up in case you got to, <laughs> you know, change your underwear is always important for me. You got to have oh, of a course, couple yeah. changes of underwear, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I get out of the gym and I literally have an extra t shirt in my car because I'll literally take the other shirt off and then yes. just like put the other one on because I don't want to like sweat all over the place. Drive home and that sweaty stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, so this one's a kind of a deep question. So, how do you want people to know you as? Like, you know, this is your last day on earth. And like, what, like, how do you want people to know you as, you know, Evan Slaughter? It's how I want people to know me as someone who just who didn't give up, you know, um, that was kind of my thing who who struggled, you know, definitely had my struggles, definitely had, you know, my demons in, in this world and experienced that. But I but someone who who went through that and didn't quit fighting, you know, always fought to try to get it back in course and become the best version of myself that I could be. So. Awesome. Yeah, great. Um, last question. So actually. Actually, I have another one. So you've done a lot of podcasts, a lot of podcasts, because yeah. I, I I was doing my research. So what what do you like about podcasts that you keep on wanting to do more and more? Um, you know, I heard someone else say one time, I think it was a social media influencer that's got a big following, is that they never turn down a podcast invite. And, and I can say that for the most part. Uh, for me, that's been the case. You know, if someone approaches and they've got a they got a deal going on, I want to I want to get out there because it's an opportunity for me to share my story, right? And it's also an opportunity to help the person grow in their podcast. Um, you know, if I I know if I had a podcast going and I approached somebody that I, I really wanted on the show, my hopes would be that they would say yes and and come and enjoy it and have a good time. Um, yeah. I think the only podcast that I would turn down is is one that just didn't align with 
my beliefs and my values and what I'm trying to do and what, you know, wouldn't make sense for me to be on. I think I've only had about two invites for, for one. So I was like, let's just, I just don't see myself doing, you know, being a, being a value here, being able to really contribute to, to what you guys are sharing or whatever. Um, not knocking them or their podcast or anything, just, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Like, why? I don't even know why you asked me. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but no, for the most part, I, I, I'd i say that uh, I enjoy the opportunity to share my message. And I've met a lot of cool people and a lot of cool connections from doing them and uh, like contributing and helping to help someone grow their platform as well. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Um, last question. All right. Um, so where can people reach out to you if they have any questions about like, you know, being a content creator, like, you know, doing CrossFit or pretty much anything. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'm pretty good about responding to DMs on Instagram. You are, you are, yeah. Sometimes they get, <laughs> uh, you know, hectic or whatever, but I always check my hidden requests folder, even if a message goes there, just to see who's reaching out. Um, but also my email that's on my profile, fit to serve MGMT at gmail.com. It's me that checks and responds to that email. Um, I do have a manager now, but all of that is forwarded to her separately. So anybody that sends an email as well, I, I do my best to go through those too. Awesome. Very cool. Well, Hey, thank you for coming on. I really do appreciate like, you know, you taking the time and, and learning more about you and, you know, just moving to Nashville, you know, your, you know, addiction to getting, becoming a better person. Thank you. Yeah, Tom, I appreciate you having me on, man, for sure. All right. That is it. Thank you. For